Welcome to today's episode of Marketing Innovators Podcast. Today we have a very exciting guest, Ken Unger, who is the president and founder of Charge, focused on unlocking the power of sponsorships to enhance the brands and grow the businesses of the C-suite, sales workforce, and nonprofit space alike. Using one guided principle, leave your clients better than you found them. Ken's clients and collaborators have included Honda, Acura, the Los Angeles Dodgers, Coca-Cola, Disney, General Motors, Jim Beam, Microsoft, Reebok, and 50 plus professional athletes in the NFL, NASCAR, and IndyCar. In his own words, Ken has embarked on a weirdly diverse career, sticking to following his passions and taking opportunities when they present themselves. He's been a lawyer, government official, and marketer, as well as serving as a league representative, event promoter, and business leader at the highest levels of professional sports. Ken's experience in sports business and personal branding, media training, sponsorships and endorsements, as well as agents and legal issues inspired him to pen his second book, Sponsorship Strategy, Practical Approaches to Powerful Sponsorships to help marketers, managers, and executives identify optimal audiences for sponsorship, solidify their sponsor's brand image, and leverage B2B and corporate social responsibility. In addition, in addition to his sponsorship prowess and behind the Velvet Rope experiences, Ken also is a veteran of the airwaves. You can find his interviews on ABC News, Associ Associated Press, CNN Money, ESPN, Forbes, Fox News, Good Morning America, LA Times, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, uh, Washington Post, Sports Business Journal, Sports Illustrated, USA Today, and World News Tonight. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks, Manib. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's uh, absolutely a joy here to have you on the show because uh, your bio, your background is definitely a mouthful. You've gone through such a significant journey over the years. And uh, I'm really glad to have you on the show today to learn about your journey and your personal backstory. So why don't you get started with how did you end up where you are today? <laughs> that's a great question because there was no plan. Yeah, that's the funny <laughs> thing is uh, I'm asked a lot, um, you know, the things that we do are sports related. So I often get asked by um, college students and people early in their career of how I got into a career that touches on sports. And the answer is I never intended to. <laughs> so it was a total accident, I guess uh, I could say, but one where I would follow my passions and took advantage of opportunities where they presented themselves. So um, that's uh, one advice I would give is always be on the lookout for opportunities that align with your passion. Because I certainly did as I went from a career in law to government to, to business, to sports business, to sponsorship. Wow. So um, tell us about Charge. Um, you know, obviously you have uh, founded Charge, and if you can tell us what the background of the company is, how did you get started, and, um, and, and what is the value proposition that it delivers? Yeah, so it was about 16 years ago um, that I had the opportunity to start my own business. Now, this was kind of a a passion that I had um, well before 16 years ago, but I, I always had that entrepreneurial spirit where I wanted to create something, uh, to build something that I would own and something that I could provide value to, to customers. And so at the time I was an executive um, in a sports business. I was um, the uh, senior vice president of the IndyCar series and the chief of staff of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And in those roles, I had touched on a lot of different areas in sports business, in broadcasting and sponsorship and marketing and strategic planning and event marketing. And really at that time, I got the bug for sponsorship and really wanted to do something aligned with that. So I left to form Charge uh, 16 years ago. And shortly after that, um, was approached by American Honda who I had known from my days in auto racing. Uh, and American Honda became client number one of Charge in 2006, and we've been working with them ever since. 
And as you listed uh, some of our clients uh, in the open, we've had a great opportunity to provide value um, in sports marketing, but sponsorship particularly ever since. Wow. So what kind of marketing has worked well for your brand? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, when you when you say that, if, if we, we approach that from the perspective of, of like a creative agency, whether it's one like the one that you own or uh, charge, you know, there's there's obviously we have to do the same things that every other small business does. And one of those things that we have to do is market, which is ironic because that's what we all do for a living. We're marketers, but we have to market for our own businesses. And what I've found over the years is that we do a really bad job of marketing ourselves. And and so Charge and my company was no exception. I view it as a little bit of um, that expression, physician heal thyself. And so, you know, the most difficult challenge for, for any small business, but I think it's doubly difficult for a marketing agency is to market ourselves. And so that's probably the biggest challenge that, that I've seen over the years. Um, it doesn't get any easier because there's this continual tension. You know, it's this tension between we're so busy with client work that we don't have the time to market ourselves. And even if we did market ourselves, um, more work would come in, which we're very busy doing anyway. So it's this kind of vicious cycle. But the flip side is, is if you stop marketing and the client work stops, um, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, so I, mean, I think the number one challenge is marketing, is for any marketing agency, is marketing yourself. <laughs> so true. I mean, I think it's always a challenge. And, you know, sometimes we get into this um, uh, sort of uh, hole of, uh, you know, helping our clients and, and continuing to, you know, keep them at the forefront. But we put our own marketing uh, at the back burner, and that really creates a challenge because if you are to grow down the road, it can it can pose some challenges. But I think you've... You've been very successful in terms of uh, building your personal brand and getting some really good quality content out there. Uh, you know, obviously uh, speaking at many opportunities there and, and doing many interviews. So, um, so maybe you can shed some light on as far as how you've actually built your personal brand over the years. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, the number one thing is when you're in a in a position when your agency is is based on one of having a particular expertise. I think the the greatest advent in marketing and and your agency is at the forefront of this is digital marketing and content creation and and the reason is a couple fold one is that for businesses that rely on expertise content marketing is in my opinion the number one strategy that you can employ because you know the traditional outbound marketing or you know cold call sales or whatever you want to call it I think it's a really, really poor method of developing new business and marketing yourself because A, you have to find a client who has a need and then B, you have to convince them that you solve that need. Right now, um, with the uh, preponderance of content marketing and SEO and how really good the search algorithms have become, whether you use Google or whatever search engine that you use, um, you find your way to the expert. And the way you find that what your way to the expert is through digital breadcrumbs that the, the expert agency leaves behind. It's through that process that clients come to you already pre-sold in a sense because the reason why they started their search for content is they have a need. And so it kind of flipped that dynamic where cold calling, at least in the, what we all do, of creative agencies is counterproductive. And the real benefit of content marketing is A, you demonstrate your expertise and B, you leave that breadcrumb straight from the client to your door. Hmm. And you've obviously targeted uh, some really large clients, uh, well-known brands, well-known worldwide brands. Um, often it's very challenging for businesses to secure such large brands and uh, how were you able to achieve that over the years? Obviously, you mentioned Honda, you know, being one of the first uh, clients. And uh, how did you, how did that actually get the wheel turning in terms of getting other sponsorship deals and getting other clients over the course of the years? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I, 
I don't believe in relationship selling, but it was, but in the case of a client like Honda, it was about relationships. Um, because here, here's the dynamic, and it's it's true in different industries, but we work so extensively in the sports industry. But right today, about 70% of our work is sports sponsorship related. And I mentioned in terms of my experience, I came from the sports business side of our market. Sports has exponential impact in terms of um, notoriety and brand awareness in terms of consumers because so many people consume sports. However, the industry itself is tiny. It's super, super tiny compared to like, you know, so you mentioned Honda is one of our clients. It's part of the auto industry and worldwide, the auto industry is maybe the largest industry. I haven't checked stats recently, but it's certainly in terms of number of people employed, it's one of the largest industries. Sports industry, probably one of the smallest industries. <laughs> so if you're in an industry like that, that's more niche size than, than mass market size, relationships matter. And so, for example, I don't know if Honda would have come to our agency if we didn't have a relationship with them that dated back into our days in sports. So we worked with them when they were not a client. Um, we demonstrated the appreciation for their business. We had demonstrated our appreciation for Japanese business culture, all these different things that kind of, you know, convinced them prior to coming to us that we could make a good partner and we could make a good consultative vendor for them. Hmm. That's a very important point because you see often when it comes to marketing, um, a lot of uh, companies and, and professionals, they confuse the fact that, uh, oh, it's just about producing content. It's just about you know doing the tactical stuff. But what you've actually taken is a very strategic approach in, not in, 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 a, in presenting yourself, creating that relationship. And obviously, there is marketing associated with that. You know, you're basically positioning yourself in front of them. And uh, and all and, and basically presenting to the, presenting to them uh, the solutions that you are able to offer over a period of time, and it's about nurturing those relationships. And I think that's where marketing has become really um, you know it's it's a, it's a challenge to kind of identify what exactly is marketing. But the key thing here is to you know understand that whenever you're actually giving a message out there, and there's a a prospect that is receiving your message, whether it's through um, you know, a sponsored ad or whether it's to a relationship, that is marketing. It's positioning yourself. Absolutely. And that positioning, whether you have a relationship or not, ho hopefully you do, is is about nurture. And, and so I, that's why I look at, I'm not here to um, promote any particular platform, but I really like LinkedIn as a platform because from a nurturing perspective, you can align your contacts, align your relationships um, in one single community and kind of nurture them in terms of congratulating people when they've done great things or connecting with them on issues that matter to them when the opportunity arises. And so I view it as, I mean, that's kind of the, the, the social platform way. You can obviously do this, you know, old school, which is, you know, email. Now, email is old school, which I kind of laugh at. <laughs> but um, you could do it kind of, kind of manually one relationship at a time, or you could do it en masse through something like LinkedIn or the other social platforms. But again, to your point, it is about nurturing relationships uh, because, you know, ultimately your personal brand is based on that. It's based on the body of work. Did you have success? Did you, um, when faced with a tough situation, what kind of decisions and judgment did you um, express that also speak to your personal brand? So all of these things kind of accumulate into a body of work that kind of follow you from engagement to engagement. And believe me, um, with how small the world is now, that, that world, word gets around about whether you did a good job or a not so good job. Hmm. So when it comes to such large clients um, and big brands, obviously the sales cycle is quite large and there's a lot of patience that is involved and, and, and also uh, a lot of relationship that needs to be nurtured before the point they actually start doing business with you. Um, what kind of tips or advice can you give to potential other businesses that are looking to secure some large contracts and, and work with worldwide brands such as, uh, such as these? 
Well, two two thoughts. One is I'll I'll address your question directly, but I just want to kind of state for the record, we have small clients, <laughs> and so f- we we have a diversity of clients. Uh, anything from one person startups, you know, all the way through large brands like Honda. So certainly, in a, uh, a firm like Charge, is not all about big clients. It's about clients of any size. Um, but I, I'd have to say the common denominator. And I mentioned this word before, and I think it's really important, um, and that's the word expertise. And so, you know, if you are in a market, whether it's digital marketing or, you know, general business marketing or advertising, public relations, you know, design, any of the creative areas, um, you have competitors. And the question is, do you have expertise that allows you to position in a way to differentiate from your other competitors. If you don't, you're a commodity. If you do, you have the opportunity not only to secure engagements in your particular area of expertise, but you also have the ability to to charge a premium in terms of the service fees that you provide because of that specific and unattainable expertise from from other sources. And so if you look at if you look at larger clients, so I'll, let, let's go straight to the heart of your question. If you're a smaller agency or any size agency and you're looking for larger clients, larger clients hire on expertise, right? They have a specific problem and they're not unlike, you know, smaller clients. And that is they're looking to solve their problem using a specific expertise. If you as an agency align yourself in solving that problem with your specific expertise, you win. And if, if you're just another blankety blank, you know, design agency or just another, you know, just another, um, PR firm, you will lose and you will unlikely be able to attract whether that's that larger client or smaller client. So I strongly believe in the value of positioning. And I also believe within that to go to as small a niche as client work exists. Hmm. There's a very uh, popular saying, you know, the riches are in the niches or the riches are in the niches, right? So it's, uh, uh, it's important to really separate yourself from the rest by targeting a specific niche. And I think that way your messaging is a lot clearer and you can also be the champion of the expertise that you're trying to promote. And uh, I think that uh, a lot of companies, especially in our industry as well, they try to do everything for everyone and they lose because they're not able to maintain it, they're not able to position themselves, and they do become a commodity, which is, I think, uh, then you're basically competing on pricing, which is uh, basically a path, uh, you know, it's, it's downhill, right? I mean, you can't really excel and scale from there. So um, it's interesting you mentioned that you also work with smaller clients, because now <laughs> I do want to know, I mean, obviously you have a different approach for larger clients and a different approach for smaller clients. And obviously the sales cycles differ as well. And uh, from a marketing perspective, um, how has marketing been different when you're trying to target, let's say a larger client versus someone who is smaller? I, um, so our, our customer personas are really based on roles within an organization. They're not based with, on the size of an organization. So, you know, for example, um, one of our um, customer personas is the leader, CEO, executive director, whatever you want to call his or her position of an organization. And it could be the CEO of Honda or it could be the CEO of a startup. Um, for example, um, we recently worked with a startup that was based in Texas that is creating an entertainment venue that wanted to establish a sponsorship program right out of the box. They ask the same questions that a larger client would ask because especially in sponsorship, but I know this is true in other marketing disciplines um, because I've worked in in many of them. It's um, the same formula for sponsorship and that's know your audience, right? Solve a problem for the customer, in this case a sponsor, and follow through on what you promise. Like those are the three secrets to great sponsorship, whether it's a Fortune 500 company or to start up, you know, with that with two hundred thousand in revenue a year and two, you know, and two employees. So that's really important. That's really important to do. Now, 
Um, in terms of expertise, I think that, um, as I mentioned before, the positioning is really important. And I just wanted to, for your listeners, I wanted to, to plug the work of a colleague and someone who I really um, think is brilliant and has done a lot of research in this area, and that's David Baker, who wrote a book called The Business of Expertise, that um, we are really um, – we're enthralled with because we've we've seen the power of his thinking and about his positioning um and i would really suggest your listeners if they if they don't check out one of our books that they check out <laughs> david's book on the business of expertise because i think it, it'll it will really help especially smaller creative agencies in really getting your head aligned around what's effective positioning and how to go after clients large and small wow um it's interesting you mentioned that, Ken. I was actually, uh, I'm part of another mastermind group, and uh, the book, uh, The Business of Expertise, actually came up last week, and I actually placed an order uh, just uh, yesterday over the weekend um, uh, of, of this book, and I'm looking forward to it because I think it's, uh, there's some really important highlights in this book that I think any professional can, can gain. Uh, but I do want to talk about your book as well. And... Um, you know, sponsorship strategy. Tell us a little bit about that and, and what exactly does it entail? Yeah, sponsorship strategy was a certainly a labor of love. I um, What I wanted to do with the book, and so I started this in 2019, and it what I really wanted to do was sponsorship can be done really well or it can be done not well. And what I've seen over the 25 years that I've, that I've worked around sponsorship is when sponsorships don't go well, people blame sponsorship as a as a form of marketing. They don't blame the fact that they, they might have done it incorrectly or they might have done it in a way that was designed for failure. And so what I wanted to do in defense of sponsorship as a, as a really effective and viable form of, of marketing is create a primer for it in terms of kind of some basic strategies that can be practically applied to make sponsorships more powerful, both things that sponsors can do, and the, these are the people that buy sponsorship, or what properties can do, and these are the, the organizations that sell sponsorship. So whether you're on wh whatever side of the table you're on, you can really kind of make the most out of sponsorship. So I started this project in 2019. Um, it was difficult. We were really busy with, with client work at the time. And then the pandemic hit. So it's March of um, 2020. And at the time, um, the event business had really bottomed out because <laughs> sports were going on hiatus. Sponsorships were going on hiatus. I, the time I did spend uh, with client work was renegotiating contracts um, because of what had happened with the pandemic. But it also gave me a lot of time to finish a book. <laughs> so in the summer of 2020, um, we were able to finish the book, uh, publish it to, with the help of Amazon. And so a sponsorship strategy um, is available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle. <laughs> That's great. We'll definitely include a link to the, uh, to the book here in our podcast. Um, what, uh, I mean, obviously I was going to, go into a little bit more detail about COVID because, I mean, COVID has impacted so many different, uh, so many businesses at, at different levels. And for some, it's been great. For some, it's been devastating. Tell us a little bit about how COVID has impacted your business. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, you know, our story is no different than millions of businesses worldwide um, in the U.S. and Canada, everywhere. Um, it disrupted so many different areas of business. I mean, some businesses were not affected. If you owned a supermarket, you probably did pretty well. Um, but the rest of us, we struggled. Um, and if not for a government PPP loan um, and, and several clients early paying, I mean, we still lost a tremendous amount of revenue. Uh, we had to lay off staff. It was a horrible, horrible time. But if I look back at the sponsorship market, what I did see was people reacting really quickly uh, and leveraging available digital tools. So we saw so much being moved from live event to social media. Uh, we saw the um, the LA Dodgers doing a, a fan event 
on Twitter where they uh, they attracted 10,000 fans because Major League Baseball was shuttered at the time. So 10,000 fans came to an event on social media. We saw uh, virtual conferences. We saw virtual sponsorships. Uh, once uh, sports started, if they couldn't have fans, we saw cameras go into the sports and create virtual fan experiences that were sponsored and all those different things. So what we did see during the pandemic was an immense amount of creativity. And that creativity, it, it didn't replace live events. I mean, nothing can truly replace live events. That's the attraction of sports is that that live and unpredictable and you can't you can't DVR it component. Uh, but what we saw was through the pandemic, um, an immense amount of business creativity. And that saved a lot of industries. And it certainly, I wouldn't say it saved the sponsorship industry, but it certainly kept a heartbeat alive at a time that was really, really trying for you know thousands of businesses worldwide. Hmm. So with your business, uh, with Charge, what, uh, what, is, what are some of the biggest opportunities that you're looking for in the near future? Yeah, we're looking in the sponsorship area. Um, I think, and I, we just we, we just wrote an article about it that we published today. As a matter of fact, um, there are several areas of, of tremendous growth that we see in in 2022 and beyond, and that includes uh, purpose driven sponsorship. So it's the alignment of corporate social responsibility and not-for-profit um, missions and impact. It's aligning those two around the vehicle of, of corporate sponsorship. We think that for-profit companies and non-profit companies will find authentic ways to work together, whether it's on sustainability or um, some of the you know, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals worldwide. We're going to see a lot of that in the sponsorship space. I expect that to be an area of tremendous growth, not only for the industry, but for our um, consulting firm in the days, months, and years to come. Uh, I see kind of the the issues around what, what's been called, whether it's called Web 3.0 or the metaverse or, or other things like that, the rise of cryptocurrency, uh, NFTs, all of that is going to change the game in sponsorship because it's going to change the game in content creation and distribution. And so we believe that that's going to be an area of tremendous growth and opportunity. Uh, that's something that we're aligning our firm uh, around that in terms of being experts that can guide clients in, in those particular areas. So I'd say those, if I, if I had two areas that, uh, that we're looking to in the future, it's definitely it's purpose-driven sponsorship and kind of the Web 3.0 and related um, issues. Hmm. So on more of a personal note, uh, Ken, if you were to go back 10 years, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> well, I, I'm thinking like the third book that I would write would be called The 5,000 Mistakes I've Made in Running a Business. <laughs> <laughs> and so the longer it takes me to write, the title's going to change. It'll be The 6,000 Mistakes and 7,000 Mistakes. I kind of referenced I, I referenced uh, the thing I regret the most um, is, is part of our chat earlier, and that's uh, lifting the pe lifting off the pedal in terms of marketing ourselves. I think um, the biggest issue in any market sector and whatever kind of agency or firm that you are is being known to your prospective customers, and you the only way to do that is through marketing. And if 10 years ago with my younger self, I would have said, don't stop marketing. Because it was only within the last three years that we, that we rediscovered the importance of marketing our agency. And prior to that, um, it was, we were so focused on client work. And I, I'd say that that hindered our growth. We'd be a much different agency uh, had I known that 10 years ago. So Ken, you've mentioned you've made 5,000 or so mistakes over the course of your business. Can you maybe highlight the top three mistakes that you've made and what kind of impact it has had on your business? Yeah, we've got to hurry up this podcast because it'll be up to 6,000 soon. So. <laughs> <laughs> so so if I had to share um, kind of in general issues that I didn't know about before owning a business, but unfortunately um, experienced the mistakes of it, there are things like... Um, 
you know, hire what you should do is hire slow and fire fast. And unfortunately, I would do things like hire fast and fire slow. And it ends up having negative consequences to the business, to the people who work in the business, to sometimes in, in some cases to clients. And so that's one thing that comes to mind. And another thing that comes to mind is that the leaders of an organization, they have to be the vanguard of the culture. They've got to protect it at all costs. And it needs to be really clear, everyone who, who works at, you know, in a particular business, what are those, um, what are those cardinal sins that, that, or lines that can't be crossed in the corporate culture? Because once one person crosses it, um, it taints the, the culture, sometimes irreparably, irreparably if um, the person who's supposed to protect the culture doesn't. And that person, in, in, in the circumstances of my company, was me. And so, like, making those mistakes, uh, those are two that come to mind or two kind of general areas. Um, nothing prepares you, you for that. But if you're listening to this podcast, um, give thought to that and whether if you're the leader of your agency, whether you're doing that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. Uh, there's a saying, obviously, that uh, you know, uh, one bad apple can spoil the rest, right? So it's. Uh, I think that's how it goes along, along those lines. But you have to really be careful who you bring on board uh, on your team, who's on the bus, and uh, and it's uh, quite challenging. I mean, it's tough enough to hire the right people, but once you have the right people, and if you let other people who are toxic spoil the rest, it can have a profound impact uh, on your company. Yeah, and that. And that raises another issue, kind of what you what you said, Mani, makes me think of another thing, and that's um, no one comes to work to do a bad job. And so uh, the role of leaders in an organization are coaches. I mean, I like the sports metaphor. We come from the sports industry, so I like that sports metaphor. Is Are you coaching your team? Are you helping them if they don't have the skills to be successful – are you asking them the right questions? Are you breaking down, um, you know, humility where people are afraid to ask for help or they're afraid that they don't they, – they, they can't admit that they don't know something so that you as a leader can help them because people come to work to do well. At least most do. Um, and so you've got to be that, that leader to help them reach that potential. And that's another issue that I didn't do enough of, um, and I'm certainly trying to do a lot more of today than I did 10 years ago. From your perspective, is marketing a cost, an investment, or both? Oh, I, you know, I have to say it's an investment. Um, I think if if I hear prospects call marketing a cost, I'm pretty much you know determined that they're probably not going to be a good fit. Because what should a business do? A, a business needs to mitigate costs. A, a, a business needs to decrease costs. But a business that views marketing as an investment, I mean, let's face it, marketing is about persuading people to buy what you're selling. <laughs> so the more you invest in it, if you do it right, the more you're going to sell. <laughs> so so when I find business owners that view it as a cost, they're, they're looking at it as a check the box activity. And yeah, I'm going to hire you because my colleague said I need a website. So yeah, you come design my website and be gone. And by the way, since you're a commodity, I want you to charge me as little as possible for this marketing cost. Again, mm -hmm. to perceive it as that is to radically under-optimize it. So I view it as an, as an investment, and I always look for, for clients who view, view it the same way. So true. So based on your experience and the challenges that you've overcome, what advice and big takeaway that you can, uh, that uh, are you able to give to our listeners who are uh, on this podcast? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I think about that a lot. It's something actually that my father uh, kind of instilled in me years ago, and I'm trying to do the same with my sons who are now um, leaving school and starting their careers, and that's um, be the best at what you're passionate at. Because no matter how hard you work, when the going gets tough, the only thing that will keep you going in growing as a professional and being better 
is being passionate at what you do. And the only thing that differentiates you for success is being the best at what you're passionate about. So be the best at what you're passionate about. I think it was great advice that I got and I'm going to pay it forward. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to hear, Ken. Um, so lastly, where can people find out more about yourself and contact you online? Yeah, that, uh, well, for whatever sponsorship needs you might have, check out chargesponsorship.com. We have a variety of free resources if, if your listeners are interested. If they go to chargesponsorship.com backslash free stuff, one word free stuff, they're going to find uh, free, free resources that we've put together for people either getting started in sponsorship or who are looking to up their game in terms of making it more effective for, for whether they're buyers or sellers uh, to leveraging sponsorship better for business success. For sure. We'll definitely include a link to uh, the resources section in this podcast, as well as a link to your profile on LinkedIn. And uh, Ken, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing some great insights and your background. It's been such a pleasure to speak with you today and, uh, and learn about Charge. Thanks, Manib. I really appreciate being here on your podcast. Uh, thank you and, and best of luck. <laughs>